Hello, Thought Roomies, and welcome. I am so glad you are here for this special episode. If you're new to this show, my name is Hallie Rose, and I'm your host. And this week, back by popular demand, we've got my soul brother, Eric Godsey, back on the show. I feel like every time I sit down with Eric, something incredibly special happens when we get to riff together. I love doing these podcasts with him. If you haven't heard his story on our show, go back to episode 11 of this podcast and check out his incredible wisdom-filled experience with ayahuasca that he shared with me. This week though, we dive into something completely different and new. Eric is in the process of doing some research and helping to co-author a book for Aubrey Marcus. And he's doing a lot of research right now on depression and the mind and antidepressants. And if you follow Eric on Instagram or you get his newsletter, then you know he's been writing a lot about this recently and about some incredible discoveries that he feels the entire world needs to know about surrounding some of the truth that he believes has been shrouded around antidepressants and mental health in modern America. And so I'm really excited to share this, this, all this information with you. It felt so important and so timely that we pushed it to the front of the queue. Now, I just want to say, Eric and I are not doctors and anything on this podcast is not to be taken as medical advice. Obviously, always you want to consult with a medical professional before making decisions about getting off your medications. But the intention of this podcast is to present information that provides another perspective to the traditional narrative around antidepressants in our country and really across the world. So I believe that the man and the material speaks for itself. So without further ado, I cannot wait for you all to hear this episode. I can't wait to hear what comes out of it for you. Let's step into the thought room once again with our beloved Eric Godsey. Welcome back to the Thought Room. I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you for having me on again. And congratulations on the podcast and the book and just being dope as fuck. Thank you. I feel the same way about you. You are doing so many cool things. I mean, the last time we recorded, it was back in November, but I didn't release the episode until earlier this year. And it was, well, I had the sheer honor of being the first person to speak with you after your ayahuasca experiences. And I know you did a lot of podcast interviews about it, but I'm just going to say I was the first. Hey. So, uh, <laughs> so that was great. It's actually my favorite one to revisit. I've revisited those podcasts a couple of times when I feel like I've lost the thread of the truth that I felt there <clears throat> and the podcast with you, because it was the very next day, there's something in my energy mm. on that one that isn't translated. And the ones where maybe I'd integrated the story linguistically better, but the, like the felt knowing right. that was there. Like when I have to tune myself, I'll actually go back and listen to that podcast. So thank you for giving me the opportunity mm. to be able to do that. That's so beautiful. Why does that happen to us? You know, that happens to me so often where I'll learn things or I'll have these big awakening moments and I'll be like, of course, it was all right here. The truth was in front of my eyes the entire time. And now I know it and I feel it and I embody it. And I act that way for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's this forgetting, forgetting that happens. I don't know what that is. 
The first thing that comes to mind that's interesting is that it's one of the archetypical stages of the hero's journey, which is stage 11 and its resurrection. Mm -hmm. And the way that I interpret that is it's the forgetting and the remembering. So Mm -hmm. like it's been with humans since we've been telling stories. Mm -hmm. Why I think that is, is on one level, and I was talking to somebody about this earlier, but we're at a point in our in our evolution where we have a set of drives that come from our genes. And the set of drives that come from our genes are not inviting us to play the same game that true identification with consciousness only is inviting us to play. And it seems to be that these beautiful experiences were not in the gene game. And the gene game is I have to be the best, I have to have the status, I have to have the money, I have to have the mate, I have to protect my children, you know. But the consciousness story is, I am. Mm, mm, mm. And as long as you're in a body and the genes are producing emotions and the emotions are producing behaviors and the the behaviors are producing feedback, you're going to forget. But you get to remember. And one of the things that I find like seems to be a useful story to give people who are beating up themselves about the forgetting is imagine that your consciousness is a symphony and the high self, quote unquote, is the conductor. If you tune an instrument, the conductor doesn't believe, well, now that I've tuned that instrument, I never have to tune that instrument again. Mm. No, what a conductor does is as soon as it's out of tune, I can now tune it faster. I know how to tune it. And so if you think you solve a problem and it comes back, there's like this spiritual dance that people get tripped up on where it's, oh, fuck, I didn't solve this thing. When maybe it's not about a, I solve it once and it's done forever. Maybe it's, oh, the instrument needs to be tuned again. I can tune it. Mm. Yeah. And and for me, there's like this trusting that even like the process isn't linear. And I'm actually thinking about an ayahuasca experience I had where I was being shown my life's purpose. Congratulations. Casually. (laughs) And I remember the immensity, like the cellular overload that was happening at that moment going, holy shit. Oh my God. It was like strapping in for the biggest energy rush and just so much information jammed into one moment that it, it, I felt like I was going to implode. And I remember it feeling like as I watched the entirety of my life from beginning to end, things that have occurred and have not yet occurred, my brain trying to grasp onto the events and the thoughts and the messages and make sense of them in Mm. real time as they were occurring. And the metaphor that comes to me is it was like sand being poured through my hands and the moment it passed through my fingertips, it was gone and I was trying to grasp onto all these singular grains. Yeah. And I was freaking out. I was going, I know this is important. How am I going to know what my life's work is if I can't remember it? I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting. And I was saying that during the experience. And the message that came through was just trust that you'll remember what you need to Mm -hmm. and trust that seeing is enough. So there was a sense of, well, just because I can't stay conscious of it all the time doesn't mean that the work is not there and being done. It's like our dreams, right? We don't remember it all the time, Mm -hmm. but the work is absolutely being done. And so just to relinquish the guilt of, of not being able to get everything perfect all the time and trust that, okay, this is part of the dance. The work yeah. is happening and it's a spiraling in and out of forgetting and remembering. And what's beautiful is where my mind was going, <clears throat> you started to go there uh, when you talked about dreams. Never happens with us. <laughs> gang, gang. <laughs> the, like one of the best gifts that I feel like I've gotten from studying Carl Jung is to really connect to the immensity of what the unconscious mind is. And when I hear that story, I've had this belief since I was younger, before I knew about Jung, and then now it's just more emboldened after knowing about Jung. But like when I was younger, 
when you were younger? Yeah, I, I, I also <laughs> thought that and I resisted making the pun for well, the sake I of didn't, the viewers. So Let's you go. You are welcome. Let's go. Um, that I've, I've always had this faith that whatever I read, I'll remember what I need to remember when I need to remember it. Mm. And whether or not that's true, I think that believing it enhances the ability for that to be there. But once I found out about Jung and started to understand how he saw the unconscious, like your dreams are created by a part of you. It is only the little conscious mind that is interacting with the thing that creates the dreams. The thing that gave you the visions in ayahuasca is you. Mm -hmm. And it's only the ego that is trying to pick up the grains of sand. And the yep. thought that was coming up in my mind is, how could you forget if your unconscious is the beach? Mm -hmm. Right. Like the sand that mm -hmm. falls through your hands. Like the you that catches all the sand is the beach. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that Jung kind of sees the psyche is like the conscious mind is 1%. Your subconscious mind is like 9%. And your unconscious mind is 90%. Mm -hmm. But it's all there. Mm -hmm. When you need it, it arises. Mm. That's beautiful. I want to ask you right now, because you're working on so many things. You're working on the book with Aubrey. You are working, you just finished your course, your mm -hmm. what is a writing course or a journaling course? Yes. Okay. And so I want to ask what in your life right now, are you just so jazzed up about talking oh about, God. like you're lit up and you just want to, yep. yep, let's, let's go there. What is that thing for you? Uh, what I am finding out about the scientific literature, about the effectiveness of antidepressants, what I'm finding out about the historical about the history of the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, the history of the DSM, which is the Diagnostic mm -hmm. St Statistic Manual, which is the book that we use to classify whether or not someone has a mental illness. Uh, finding right. out about, it is public knowledge, and I have the quotes from the people who created the DSM. No mental illness that is in the book, and there's almost 400, mm -hmm. Not a single one is based off a single biological discovery that any of these things are caused by anything biological. Mm. The way that a disease, a quote unquote, and the fact that we call it a disease is a lie. Mm. But any of these disorders that got into the DSM, the way they got into the DSM is 12 white dudes who were psychiatrists voted on whether or not this thing existed. <clears throat> Totally. Like, wasn't hysteria, like yep. it, well, hysteria was in the DSM. I assume it's not anymore, but it was this idea that like a woman's uterus, like hysteria from the same root as like what you know of as hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. Right. So a bunch of white dudes decided, oh, this is, this is a, a um, disease that is a woman's wandering uterus. It's, it's when a woman basically isn't being <laughs> impregnated and she starts to be depraved and crazed. Right. That was in the DSM. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> the person who created the DSM three, which was the first one that started to make the argument that these weren't biological diseases. I have the quotes, they're public knowledge. He says, there is not a single biomarker for any of these disorders. Also, uh, the chemical imbalance hypothesis for mental disorder, for depression, mm -hmm. for schizophrenia, for bipolar disorder, and for ADHD, <clears throat> there's not a single piece of scientific evidence that has gone to explore that hypothesis that found support for it. There have been studies that have gone, and I'm writing an article <clears throat> right now just so I can organize all this shit in my own brain because it feels like all this stuff I'm writing to organize it for me, but I just wrote the section today where I lay out every single study that had been done. So the hypothesis was first put forward in 1967. And the person who put forward the hypothesis was like, this is a huge oversimplification. This is a hypothesis. We need to have studies in the future to see if this is true. Like six studies got done over the course of 20 years. 
no study found any evidence that there is a cause of having low any chemical that causes depression or dopamine being too high for schizophrenia because that was the idea back in the 60s. And then learning the history about why people believe this story. And the history about why people believe this story is that the American Psychiatry Association in 1980 changed a rule. Oh, and by the way, like the chemical hypothesis idea officially died in the scientific literature in like 1984 when the National Institute for Mental Health basically reviewed the studies that have been done and said, in science language, we find no evidence for this. But in 1980, the APA, which is a business, was starting to go out of business for some reasons we don't have to get into. <clears throat> so they changed a law where pharmaceutical companies could now pay the APA to host symposiums and that the APA would let pharmaceutical companies pay psychiatrists to give talks at these symposiums. And the APA promised the pharmaceutical companies you will be able to get the final okay on what is said. Over the next seven years, the APA's revenue doubled from 10 million to like 22 million. Almost all that money came from pharmaceutical companies paying the lead psychiatric association in the country to hold talks where the pharmaceutical companies got to pay the psychiatrists who taught other psychiatrists and the pharmaceutical companies got to write what the talks were. And then we got lied to by pharmaceutical companies and by the APA. And the documentation in the books that I'm reading is like, it's public knowledge. This is not a secret, but it just, anything that doesn't get said in the pandemonium of what is going on, it's, it's as if it doesn't exist. And the studies that are just starting to come out within the last 10 years that are looking at the long-term effects of taking any psychiatric med, what they're finding is that it increases the likelihood of whatever symptom you had that then led you to be prescribed either an antipsychotic, anti-anxiety, or antidepressant, the chemical imbalance that gets created by taking the pill actually makes you more susceptible to the symptoms that you had before. And the technical reasons for that are kind of long to explain, but there was a Harvard psychiatrist who published a study in one of the top psychiatric journals in the early 2000s that basically wrote an essay on this is what's happening. But the way it was presented was like, I figured out how the drugs work. There wasn't talk about like, oh, there is scientific evidence that there was no chemical balance before. Now we have evidence that by taking any of these long-term, it creates a chemical imbalance. Mm. And once you have the chemical imbalance, you then have chemical dependency symptoms if you get off of it too quickly. And that's why you always hear you have to consult with a doctor to get off mm. because it's incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. because they've, these pills have created mm. a disorder that did not exist before. And where it gets really tough is that many people will claim that it helped them. And many doctors will claim it helps my patients. Where this gets weird is the reason we've developed the scientific method was because N of one is not science. And so if you're depressed and you go to a doctor and they give you an antidepressant <clears throat> and then you claim that you feel better and that you don't need to take the antidepressant anymore, even though that's very uncommon. When, once people start, they tend to stay on it. You don't know that the depression wouldn't have healed on its own without you having taken the pill. And mm -hmm. that's why we've developed the scientific method before the pharmaceutical companies got a lot of power, many psychologists wrote papers about the spontaneous remission rates of depression. Mm -hmm. And the cultural understanding of what depression was is that it was very rare. And that when it happened, almost 50% of people had a spontaneous remission within six months. Mm -hmm. 
without anything being done. And the reason I'm so excited about this right now is like, I got a degree in psychology. I've been reading psychology books basically every fucking day for 10 years. I didn't know this <laughs> until two weeks ago. I know if I didn't know this, almost no one I've ever met in my life knows this. Wow. And this is not a YouTube video about how the world is flat. Mm -hmm. This stuff is in the scientific journals. What's wild is um, one of the main books that I've read about this stuff, it came out in 2008. Once it came out, he started debating psychiatrists at like big, at big universities and hospitals. And the most famous encounter is he went to um, the main hospital in Massachusetts, which is the branch of Harvard. And he was quote unquote debating like one of the top psychiatrists in the country. And the psychiatrist said, and I have the exact quote written down and where it's from, but it's basically, you know, it's upsetting to me that you're telling people that psychiatry believed this story about a chemical imbalance. We've always known it was a legend. Mm -hmm. Like it's a myth. Like we have gotten to the point, And I think they had this debate in like 2014, where at 2014, psychiatry is claiming it never even believed in the chemical imbalance theory. But if you asked a hundred people for the next month, mm -hmm. Why, why do people get depressed? Right. 93 of them are going to say a chemical imbalance. Right. And it seems to be that the entire pharmaceutical wave of anti or of psychiatric meds seems to, on the whole, have been worse for us than better for us. And... I'm super motherfucking excited about how can this situation be improved? Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that has me so excited is my entire life, I've been studying great people from the past or studying science about how the individual mind operates. I've never actually felt called to engage with what is happening now because I've always felt like I can't do anything. But now I feel I'm being called mm -hmm. and I feel like I have the potential to become someone who can make a difference in this part of the social game. And I feel called to go do it. And so that's what everyone I meet, like I was just at Walgreens or I'm uh, at Whole Foods yesterday and I was telling a cashier this shit because I can't stop not talking about it. Yeah, no, totally. Um This very much aligns with my experience. I've shared this with you already, but it's, this is part of actually how I was raised like this to be very discerning about uh, pharmaceuticals in general, but particularly antidepressants. And when I hit rock bottom depression a few years ago, I remember letting my dad know and saying, yeah, I don't really want to live anymore. And I'm kind of worried about that. And he was like, yeah. Okay. Like, let's talk about this. And I tried to find like three therapists, tried three different therapists in New York city. And I felt like I couldn't find one aligned with my belief system or open to alternatives. Right. And I just kept f feeling like I was this trying to be shoved into a box that I just didn't fit in. And it made me feel more isolated and more alone. And eventually I went to my dad. I was like, I, I need to do something like I'm not really good right now. And it's terrifying me. And I was like, I think I'm going to try antidepressants. And it was like, oh, what? He's like, let me just, let's try one more thing. So let me send, send you some CBD. I was like, what CBD? What's that going to do? And, but I was desperate. And I think for, for maybe like, it wasn't very long, like two to three weeks, I took like insanely high dosages of CBD enough to lift above my thoughts and kind of just be like, oh, okay. Wow. The sun is out. I didn't like notice there was a sun yeah. today because I was so pinned down by the darkness of my own thoughts. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good feeling. And, um, but this is, this is not, this is not new to me, but I'm really, 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 really glad you're talking about this. However, some people listening to this are not going to want to hear it 
they're going to be like, but I have depression and I have a chemical imbalance and you're discounting my experience. And what, you know, what, what would you say to those people who are feeling that? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of threads here. One is that if you have been taking antidepressants for more than a couple of weeks, you do have a chemical imbalance, but you didn't have it before. The best, there is literally not one study that has found that a chemical imbalance causes depression. But there are studies that find that once you take it chronically, you now do have a chemical imbalance. Not one study. Not one study. Not a single study. Hmm. So I can't claim that I've read every study because I haven't. Mm -hmm. But of the people who have been writing these books about this thing, there hasn't been a um, a contender to them who has brought a piece of science to it. Like, again, the most famous book that's talked about this, his response when he goes and debates these people is they claim, we don't believe that. Mm. We've never believed that. So how, so then can you explain for people listening, how do these antidepressants, these SSRIs, like how do they act on the brain? What's actually chemically supposedly happening? What's the story that's being told and and what's the truth? Yeah. So there's a couple of threads here. Um, To the person who's listening that has resistance to what's being said, I would have resistance too. I would absolutely have resistance if... Everyone that I've ever talked to about this situation has told me that I have a chemical imbalance. My doctor has told me that I have a chemical imbalance. They've given me something that maybe makes me feel better. My intuition though, is that if you checked in with how you feel, you can feel that whatever it is, isn't solved. And even though there is a part of you that's like, fuck you, fuck you. You don't fucking know. Like, fuck, like the part of you that wants to kill me or break me or whatever. There are other real options. And I think the only way to those options is to recognize that the path that this story invites you to go down, it doesn't seem to be helping. Like just a quick stat. Something like a million people were disabled due to mental illness the year before Prozac came out. Um, In 2017, it's something like 11 million people are disabled by mental illness. Hmm. These things were sold to us as the mental equivalent of antibiotics. That's why they have the name. When you look at all the diseases that antibiotics are supposed to heal, if you look at how many people in our culture die from them, before the antibiotics existed, it was the leading cause of death in the US. Once they were invented 10 years later, almost no one except the elderly or the severely ill die from bacterial infection. It's because they work. Mm. Before these were introduced, um, I think in 1955, it was something like 400,000 people in our country were disabled due to mental illness. As of four years ago, or as of three years ago, it's 11 million. Like something's not working, but one of the reasons why I've been hesitant to share this is because I want to bring solutions as opposed to just telling people like this doesn't work. What I've found so far, and I'm going to spend the rest of my fucking life trying to understand this more. Like I know this is where I'm called to go, but there is a biological basis here. And what it seems to be what we're just discovering within the last 10 years, but it's not in any of the fucking textbooks that are being taught to people who are being trained to be doctors is chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation has a high correlation with all mental disorders and with all disease, 100%, like (laughs) duh, like that has never been in the literature Mm. about what causes a mental disorder, at least what's been told to MDs and what's been told to psychiatrists they don't look at your motherfucking diet. Mm-hmm. They don't look at your lifestyle. Most of them don't even know to order a blood test to chest if you have high inflammation. Right. Levels Cortisol. In your blood. Right. Yeah. So you could do a Google search and educate yourself on how you can eat 
live and behave in a way that reduces inflammation. That's ground one for everybody. Mm -hmm. The next thing is the way depression is created in rats so they can study the effects of antidepressants before they come to human trials. Like when I found this out, I had to get up and I, I started yelling in my house because it was like, <clears throat> once you take a step back and look at this, it's like the answer was in front of our faces from the fucking beginning. The way we've, the way scientists have been inducing depression symptoms in rats for the last 50 years is there's two ways. One is called the forced swim test. And you put a rat in a glass container with water where it has to swim and you wait for it to break where it gives up <clears throat> because it's hopeless. There is no way to get out of the water and they can't stop. They literally put it in an impossible situation where it can't do anything. And then it just starts to float and then it takes it out and then they pump antidepressants into it. And if it tries again, they're like, oh, it works. And then the other one is they hang a rat from its tail and the rat will try to like bend up to like release its tail until it breaks, until it gives up, until it sees that what it's trying to do is hopeless. And then those are the two ways that we induce depression in animals. You don't breed for a gene and you don't inject it with a chemical. You literally put you the put animal in, a situation in an environment to create it where it feels hopeless. Duh. So talk about the implications of what this means for people who are trying to follow this thread as far as humans. It basically means that our depression is created by what? The situations, the emotional at, states. At, at least a large subset right. of depression is a response to the felt experience that mm -hmm. your situation is hopeless. And we can- right. So there are biological indicators that you might be depressed. Like we're saying, like, um, if you are depressed, certain things will probably show up. Like you might have these high states of inflammation. You might have right. all this, think, but chicken and the egg, right? So, and where it gets even weirder is that depression is a word mm -hmm. that 12 white dudes in a room voted on had nine symptoms and mm -hmm. that you had to have five to be depressed. Like our measurement tool isn't, even based on science. Mm. So that's why this is, right. there's a bunch of threads. So there's something that happens to people who are highly inflamed mm. that seems to fall into the cloud of the symptoms we've decided right. equals depression. Right. And then there's something that happens in the human psyche that when your story is that it's hopeless and there's a combination of a bunch of factors that would lead you to the story that your situation is hopeless, that creates a type of thing. And I'm sure that believing that your situation is hopeless produces inflammation, but so there's some overlay. But now we have a third category. And the third, and the third category are the people who have been taking these long-term, which they probably had one or both of the two first ones, either the inflamed brain or the hopeless mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. But now we have literally created a chemical imbalance mm -hmm. that needs to be treated by doctors mm -hmm. in a way that didn't need to before. And so from my research right now, it seems like there's this pool of three major things that are going mm -hmm. on here. And like, again, the fucking craziness is our measurement tool isn't even scientific. Right. Like there is no biological test that you can take that tells you, you have one of these mental disorders. Mm -hmm. It's literally some dudes 50 years ago argued about what they thought these things were. And then they voted. Mm-hmm. So your question before was, so what are these chemicals actually doing? The hypothesis for the chemical imbalance idea was because we discovered what the chemicals were doing. And we hypothesized, well, if it fixes depression, depression is the opposite of what this chemical does. Mm. That's the same type of logic as if you get a rash and you put steroid cream on it, that the reason you had the rash is because you didn't have enough steroids in you. Right. Not science. Right. It's a hypothesis. It was put forward. It was tested. Mm -hmm. No evidence found to confirm it. All the evidence that they found from the test says it's actually likely this isn't true. Right. Or like if you have a headache and you take an Advil and your headache goes away, doesn't mean whatever the root of the headache is gone. Exactly. And yeah. Exactly. So what these psychoactive drugs do, because they are psychoactive drugs, is they force the machine 
into a brain state. And then if being forced into that brain state reduces the symptoms that you have, we say it's helping you, Mm -hmm. but it's forcing a brain state. It's like if you've taken Adderall or if you've taken MDMA or if you've taken LSD or whatever, it forces a brain state. Mm -hmm. And if that brain state leads to you behaving in a way where you're not depressed or you don't show the symptoms of depression, we say it works. Now, where it gets really weird is most studies don't have a placebo group at all. And most studies that do have a placebo group don't properly control for the placebo group. And I'll get into the details here for a moment. So the placebo effect is the word that we've given to the fact that if a human believes that they can heal, they can heal to the point where this has to be experimentally controlled for in any scientific study that's ever looking at humans ingesting anything. Mm -hmm. And we just (laughs) kind of wave our hands at the (laughs) fact that the scientific method has had to create a game Mm -hmm. to factor out the fact that humans can heal themselves on belief. (laughs) So most studies or at, a significant percentage of studies don't control for the placebo effect at all because it costs money. Mm -hmm. Um, The gold standard of scientific experiments is called the double Double blind blind placebo controlled study. And basically what that means is both the person giving the drugs and the person receiving the drugs don't know whether or not they're getting the drug or they're getting a placebo pill. And that's supposed to take care of the placebo effect. We're about to get into the weeds, but it's really fucking interesting. So... All these psychoactive drugs have side effects. When you put them in a double-blind placebo-controlled study, by the fourth week, and there's been studies to actually look at this, something like 80% of the researchers and the patients know which group they're in. Like if you give them a test and ask them to guess, that they are correct 80% of the time. The study's broken. And this is what happens in almost all of these studies. There's also studies that find that when the researcher knows which person got the pill, they will exaggerate the improvement unconsciously on what they perceive as the healing by like 36%. Yes, I've heard that. And I have the motherfucking study cited. Mm -hmm. So most of the studies that have ever been done on whether or not these drugs improve the condition, there's some holes in the studies. Um, what a researcher from Harvard, his name is Irving Kirsch, put forth in a book um, written like 2008 was that there's, he hypothesized there's a thing called the active placebo hypothesis. And that the effect that you see from all of these drugs to improve the condition that they claim that it improves is the placebo effect plus the felt experience of side effects that then boosts the belief that you have the thing and that it's working. And he did a study that fucking, this was the first study that I found that like broke my brain about, whoa, what I've been told about these things, it doesn't make sense. So what he did is he did what is called a meta analysis, which is where you take a whole bunch of studies and you combine them together and you look at their outcomes. He found studies where um, the drug being given to someone to help treat depression There were studies where they gave them antidepressants, obviously. There's studies where they gave them opiates. There's studies where they gave them amphetamines. There's studies where they gave them anti-anxiety medication. There's studies where they gave them antipsychotics. And there's even studies that gave them SSRIs, which do the opposite of SSRIs. Once you properly control for the placebo effect, and the way to properly control for the placebo effect for depression is you have to have a third group where you don't do anything at all Mm -hmm. because depression sometimes will just heal, Mm -hmm. quote unquote. And why that happens is interesting. But once you properly control for the placebo effect, all of these drugs improve your symptoms of depression the exact same amount. Mm -hmm. So if you just let that sit for a moment, they all improve it the exact same amount. That is a definitive evidence that it's not because of a chemical imbalance. Right. But now check this out. The universal measurement tool for depression is called the Hamilton scale. And it's basically a survey 
where you can score between zero and 51. And if it's zero, you're not depressed. And if it's all the way max, you're close to killing yourself the next day. The, there's an institution that oversees like doctors and it claims that in order for a intervention to be deemed clinically effective, the improvement on the Hamilton scale has to be three points. That's really fucking low, but it's still something. There are studies that show that if you start gardening for six weeks, your improvement on the Hamilton scale is four points. Mm -hmm. There are studies that show if you fix your sleep and you sleep for eight hours a night for a couple of weeks, it improves six points. Right. All these studies, the improvement on the Hamilton score was 1.8. And so the argument that this researcher made is the studies he analyzed were the studies that the pharmaceutical companies sent the FDA to get approval to to give these drugs to us. Mm. And the argument he made is when you control for the placebo effect, these should not have been approved. None of these should have been approved for treating depression. And it gets fucking crazier. Once he, How can it? I, <laughs> once he put out that study, a researcher emailed him and said, it's worse. You don't have all the studies. But I will send a freedom of information request to the FDA and the FDA will have to give us the hidden studies. So in order for a pharmaceutical company to get their drug approved from the FDA, they have to send every study that they've ever done on it. But the, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical companies don't release the studies that they do that don't go well. 40% of this, so of all the studies that were published, there was almost 50% that were hidden. And all these studies showed that even when the pharmaceutical company pays for the researchers to make the study, they pay for the researchers who interpret the data and they pay they pay for both those. They couldn't find that their equivalent of the antibiotic outperformed the placebo group almost 50% of the time. And they withheld those studies from the scientific community, from doctors and from the public. But the FDA knew that they did this and they didn't say anything about it. So when uh, Irving Kirsch sent the request from the FDA, he got these studies and he posted like, this shit doesn't work. And he's quoted with saying, we're going to look back in a hundred years at giving anti or giving um, psychiatric pills to people. And it's going to be equivalent to bloodletting. This is a Harvard psychologist. Tell people what bloodletting is if they don't know. So uh, 200 years ago, if there was something wrong with you, it's because we thought you had too much black bile in your body. And so we had to bleed you out yeah, there was like black bile, yellow bile. Well, White bile and I think red. And so they use le- leeches, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Didn't work. Or it probably did work to the degree that people believe the that it worked. Exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so doing the research, I also found 75% of the FDA's drug review budget is literally paid for by pharmaceutical companies the company that's supposed to be our watchdog, 75% of their drug review budget is paid for by the people they're supposed to protect us from. Mm -hmm. So that's going on. And uh, so what the pills are doing in your brain is they are literally creating a chemical imbalance, but there's no evidence that this chemical imbalance equates to the alleviation of a disease. For what they do find, and this is important to note, is that the most severely depressed people, which is a huge, is a very small minority of all the people who are diagnosed with depression, the people who are the most severely depressed, it seems to be that antidepressants in the short term do outperform placebo for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they don't know why. Mm-hmm. My intuition is that it forces a brain state change that allows for the opportunity for you to go do something that could potentially change your situation or your stories. Yeah. My intuition is if you did the exact same study with the most severely depressed and you put them through the John Hopkins protocol with mushrooms, or you Mm -hmm. put them through the MAPS protocol with MDMA, Mm -hmm. 
you won't have to try to play with the data to hopefully get it to be a little bit more effective than placebo. Mm -hmm. So I am not a neuroscientist. I can't claim anything beyond what I've seen other people say who are the doctors, but like it's public. This is not a hidden thing amongst the people in the medical community who study this. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't been given the same platform that the chemical imbalance idea got because the pharmaceutical companies paid billions of dollars for that story to be retold. Have you personally, like just in, just in the last little while from discovering this, have you talked to any um, MDs about this that you know, like in your sphere or anything like that? No, I have literally not stopped reading, but I have <laughs> a couple of them in my sphere. Um, no, I actually did talk to one MD who, and this is also why there's some fear here. Um, an MD reached out and said that two of her patients saw the post that I posted on Instagram like 10 days ago and was like worried. Mm. And so she asked me for the studies. Mm -hmm. I sent her the studies and I, have, I haven't heard back from her yet, but mm -hmm. she said that like, she really admires like the work that I'm doing and how I do it. Um, and that she hadn't heard this before. Right. And it's not their fault. It's not part of the education. Right. So, and, and, and there's this whole strange layer to being an MD from what I've heard. Um, I have MDs in my family and they get courted by these pharmaceutical companies and they get taken out to lunches and they get pens and they get other perks and there's incentives to try, to try out the, the new drugs and, um, One of the things that I learned is um, uh, Minnesota is the only state that has this law that's called like the sunshine law. And it's like either the doctors or the pharmaceutical companies have to reveal the amount of like ad money that they either receive or give. This is the only state that has this law. And basically what they found is that there's a budget within pharmaceutical companies to go to new doctors. And it's like 10K a year of free gifts mm. and they know exactly what they're doing. Their business model is they need to grow more this quarter than they did last quarter. The way they make money is to have consumers and consumers are people who have mental disorders and they want lifetime consumers. I don't think it's evil. I think it's people are like, I'm here to protect my family. These are the checklists I have to go through. I'm not thinking about the effect that it's having on potentially millions of people. I'm getting my paycheck. I'm getting my bonus. I'm getting my wife a boat or whatever it is. And I genuinely feel like I'm a son of God and that I'm doing like, I don't think it's this like. Following their training right. for the most part. Right. And. Um, Which is incriminated a lot of people over time who just said, Hey, I was just, <laughs> right. I don't want to right. draw this conclude this comparison, but I'm thinking of world war two, yeah. you know? And it's like, well, am I guilty? I was just following instruction. Well, right. it's like, if this is your duty, we have the, the Hippocratic have, oath yeah. is do no harm. Right. And like, I was thinking about that today when I was driving, like, I think most MDs, and psychiatrists truly don't know the harm. Mm. And like, there's this part of me that's like, who the fuck are you to get to fucking say this? Like me to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact is that um, I've read what I've read. I've even gone and bought books about people who don't agree with the people who are saying this stuff. But even the people who don't agree aren't claiming that there's a chemical imbalance. They aren't claiming that antidepressants fix a chemical imbalance. The argument of the most famous people who are arguing against this story is that antidepressants help sometimes for the most severely depressed for a short amount of time. Right. Like that's where the line is drawn for the people who are still saying that it's good. Like, and it's important to remember because it's before most of our times, but the story the public was given, and I have the quotes, is this is akin to the discovery of penicillin. Mm. This is akin to the discovery of insulin. Mm. 
And it's not. So we were sold a story. 100%. Hey, wait, has this ever happened to humanity before? Have we ever been sold a story and believed it? Yeah. Um, so interesting. So interesting thinking about being sold stories. And, you know, I was just, what was I listening to the other day? Um, I was listening to an old radio broadcast. Uh, I think it was the Orson Welles. Mm. Do you know about mm-hmm. that? Obviously. Um, so for those listening, it was a theater troupe that put on a retelling of, or an adaptation of the book War of the Worlds, which is about an extraterrestrial alien invasion. And this was on the radio. And people who missed the introduction saying that this was a dramatization, this was theatrical, they started to panic, started to spread across the United States. I think there's a part in the book, in the book or in the retelling, and it's very convincing, right? Because it seems like a radio broadcast and they're going, and, and now we'll go back to the music playing, being played in this hotel lobby of this hotel in Brooklyn. And then you've got like the nice jazz music. And then now we interrupt for this news bulletin. And so it's very convincing. It's a theater troupe. Um, but you know, they're talking about the, this, this correspondent on the ground in New Jersey, who's, oh, oh, he's narrating what's happening. There's this strange, you know, vehicle coming and People are listening around the U.S. People are starting to go into their basements and dig holes and try and create bunkers. Some people that kill themselves. People were fleeing New Jersey. Yeah, there, I didn't know that. But this to me is just, again, something that you and I probably beat like a dead horse, but the power of story yeah. and what we're told. And even as a, a thought experiment of like everything that's that's going on right now with the media. I mean, this was back when like radio was kind of what it was. That mm-hmm. was it. There it was wasn't, pinnacle. there wasn't TV. There wasn't social media. There wasn't the fast spreading information like we have now. And this was an accident. Like this was an accident the way that I don't think anybody in, thought that this would be interpreted as truth. Now, if I was part of the media now, I would look to that event and go, look at the power we accidentally had when we did that thing unintentionally. Like, if I really wanted to do some damage, I would just put a little bit of planning into it and go, okay, this is how I'm going to orchestrate my plan. And so right. this is the problem with, it, it's, it's not an uncomfortable thing to sit with the fact that like we, we all have to develop our own ability to discern what is truth. We do not have the luxury anymore of trusting everything that the air quotes experts have told us. We can't. We just can't. There's too much change. There's too much that needs to be changed for us to be able to do that. And so I think where I really want to invite this conversation to go to is like, okay, then what do we do? How do I cultivate that? And like, then what is depression? Like, is depression my sense of disconnection from others, from myself and from the world that I live in? And how, if that's the case, which I believe it is in my own experience, then how do we talk about that? How do we realize that I don't need to pop a whole bunch of pills? I need to feel connected, man. I need to know what my life's purpose is. I want to serve. I want to be a part of something. I don't want to feel empty anymore. I want to feel full and high off of love and off of life. So how do we do that, Eric Godsey? Let's go. (laughs) There's a couple of threads here. Like what has really grounded me is um, I'm a coach and I help people and I can, I'm feeling every time I interact with someone, what works. And so here's what I would offer is first, your foundation is your biology. Um, And we can, that's actually a philosophical thing that we could argue, but one of the pillars of your mental health is your biology. And I think the core thing for your biology, the the core marker is reduce chronic inflammation. Mm. And we could get into the details of all that stuff, but the cheat code is what did your body evolve to be doing? Mm -hmm. It evolved to be outside. It evolved to eat the type of foods that existed a thousand years ago. It evolved to be a part of a community. 
it evolved to do quote unquote exercise, but that was always goal directed that the results of it would be good for the tribe. Yes. You evolved to want to take care of young, want to take care of old, wanting to be of service to the people around you. So there's all sorts of books that you, the listener, can go look into. But I think the foundation one is reduce your inflammation. Mm -hmm. Number two is... When Nietzsche said, God is dead and we have killed him, he didn't say it like a triumphant rationalist saying hoorah. He was saying it like, we just did something we don't understand and there's going to be fallout. I think that the crux of the hopelessness part of depression is because we've killed God. Mm. And I don't care what your God is. It's all a name Mm -hmm. for a thing that's beyond the name. But what I find works with literally every human I've ever coached or interacted with is there is something inside of you that is whispering and you know, you hear it and you know that it's asking you to do things that you aren't doing because you're afraid. Mm -hmm. That's where you start. Right. And people love to ask technical questions like how, how do I hear Mm -hmm. what you're telling me is how do I stop being afraid? Because right. I don't need to give you a journaling prompt. Right. I don't know. Like if you literally closed your eyes mm. and took a couple of deep breaths mm-hmm. and asked yourself, what is the number one thing that I know you've been asking me to do that I am not doing? You will know instantly. Yeah. And then that's where it starts. Mm. What is the thing to go do? And I, And just to that point, I mean, this is something I've been writing about. Actually, I was writing about this today which is, can I be comfortable with two tracks existing at Mm. once? Can I be comfortable being terrified out of my mind because I'm falling for someone new and stay with it and still stay open? Or can I be terrified that I'm going to say the wrong thing about Black Lives Matter and offend people? and still speak because it's the right thing to do. And I think where we get stuck is a lot of times is we'll, we'll go, well, I'm afraid of that. So therefore I, I can't move or I need to work through or figure out or ch- change or push away this fear. But my practice has been ex- expanding myself beyond the fences of that limited understanding and right. realizing I can live in multiple universes and multiple experiences at one time. Amen. Yeah. The the thing that comes up for me for the hopelessness story is no one has ever had to told to tell you to admire and you've never got to choose what you admire. The fact that you admire certain types of people or certain characters from stories is that whisper inside of you shouting that I like this, right? Do that. Yeah, I like Be this. Be this. Thing. Yes. And so like, it seems like one of the most insidious things about our current story about mental illness is what it implies about what is the truth of human beings. And what it implies is that you are a biological machine Mm -hmm. here to consume within the game we've created. And if you don't, if you aren't adjusted to that, it's because you're broken and we have the pills for you. That feels like blasphemy to the human spirit. Like what the human, what I would offer as a potential story for what it means to be a human being is you are the descendant of a hundred lineages of the most bad ass adapters that have ever lived on the planet. Literally every ancestor you have was able to meet the chaos of the world well enough to reproduce. You are the result of that. And they are inside of you and they are whispering to you to go do the next dope thing. Mm. And that you are made in God's image. And I don't mean fucking Yahweh. Mm -hmm. In the thing that makes the whole thing, the fact that we can speak the fact that we can create a podcast, 
Mm-hmm. The fact that we can make art, that's what it means to me to be made in the image of God. Mm. Like <clears throat> we can create. And I think that the ultimate healing to the hopelessness story is to remember like God's inside of you mm-hmm. and she's asking you to create. Mm-hmm. And if you say yes and you create, whatever happens as a result of that is the best possible thing that can happen. And maybe feeling the symptoms that we've classified as depression, that 12 dudes in a room have chosen as depression, maybe the symptoms of crippling anxiety, Mm -hmm. maybe the symptoms of bipolar mania and -hmm. depressive episodes, and maybe hearing voices, maybe all of that is a part of the human condition. Maybe. Like there is no science that claims that it's not. It was the opinion of 0.1% of people 50 years ago that it was bad. And the last thing that I want to like offer on this thread is that there's a type of a researcher, I forget what it's called, but they study how animals respond when you put them in zoos. All mammals have some type of neurotic behavior that you never see in nature that arises when you put them in a cage for a long time. We all know about way or about orca whales and how their fins will droop. Elephants will grind their tusks against stone until they're nubs. Birds will rip out their own feathers. The, the like quote unquote, the ape in the troop that is the most vulnerable will go leave the troop and be alone and like face a corner and like will isolate itself. Zebras will do this weird thing where they start to rock all day and they don't engage with each other. What if that quote by Krishna Murti 40 years ago has been the way, which is, it is no reflection of health to be adapted into a profoundly sick society. Oh, maybe we're mm. not supposed to be inside of boxes, inside of boxes, inside of boxes, inside of boxes, put inside of a school system that was created on an island by 20 rich people who wanted to create schools to mirror factories so they could make more money. And then you're put into a cubicle, which is a cube, trying to stare at a screen, which is a square, doing fucking things. Mindlessly. Right. Like what if you've evolved to fucking dance out in the fucking forest as it rains chanting with your friends? Wait, you're not telling me that possibly depression is a symptom of the way that society systemically is, are you? Imagine that. Wow. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's probably a chemical imbalance. Yeah, probably, man. I am, just to bring in my own personal experience of the inflammation piece, some, some people maybe don't know this, but I've talked about this before on the podcast, which was, I was diagnosed with Lyme's disease, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, I think it was 2017, 2016 or 2017. I, about six months after getting it, it's one of those like weird ones where they don't really know what causes it. Some people say it's by a tick bite. I don't remember being bit by a tick. I never got a bullseye. All I know is that six months after getting it, I put on about 30 pounds. I was chronically inflamed. Like if you looked at a photo of me, you wouldn't recognize me. I had just dark circles under my eyes, bags. I was exhausted. I had stopped menstruating. I was just, my hair was falling out. And my body started to react to everything, like every food. And I always ate pretty healthy, but like every food that I ate before was just making me just, so it was weird. It was like, um, I always tell people, it was kind of like Tim Allen in the Santa Claus. You know how he like goes to bed, a young man, sort of like normal. And then like wakes up the next morning and he's graying and he's like fat. That's what would happen to me sometimes when I would get into these chronic states of inflammation. And I would just be like, fuck, it happened again. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, st- I basically had to stop eating almost everything. Yeah. Cut out dairy, cut out alcohol, cut out gluten. I was just manipulating all these, okay, can't have nuts either. 
okay, so I'm basically eating veggies and some, you know, and it was, I didn't want to, I was forced into that um, path of self-discovery to try and figure out what was going on because I was so depressed that I didn't want to get out of bed and I couldn't get out of bed because my joints were so swollen. And like, when you start getting in that cycle of like, you become jailed by your own self. Like it's, it, it becomes too exhausting because you have all the brain fog now of this like brain inflammation we're talking about. You really just become that rat who's like, I'm just going to drown now because yeah. even swimming anymore feels like too much. And I thank God and everything that is that I had parents, I had a privileged education and I had everything that I had because even with all of that, I was drowning. And my parents were saying, hey, look, let's try this supplement. Let's change up your diet. We have this, um, we can do this brain mapping with you. We can do infrared saunas. I did a sauna detox for like three months. I went in the infrared sauna every single day. I drank so much water. I sweat so much. And my sweat, Eric, at first it was alarming. I would go in the sauna at 140 degrees for an hour and I wouldn't start sweating until like 40 minutes. I was just clogged up. And most people, a healthy body, you start exercising, you start, you know, you go in a sauna, you start sweating right away. And then when I would start sweating, it would finally start pouring. And it was just like, I felt like I was detoxing metals or something. Like it was, it just did not smell right. It was just weird. And then I spent a lot of time in nature. I just sequestered myself on the lake in Canada at my, on my parents' retreat center. And brick by brick, I put myself back together. I just walked around barefoot. I did a lot of journaling. I did a lot of writing. I had a lot of alone time, but the family was right there. And I had that support. I had that community. I do not know what the solution is for everyone that doesn't have access to that. Cause I'm telling you, like I'm getting emotional talking about it right now. Like I would not be here today. I would not be here. And this is why this information that we're talking about right now is so important. And I want to help people who are listening to this and they don't have any of that. And we need to give tools and hope because what's, what's worse than depression, what's scarier than a state of being depressed is a state of being hopeless. Mm-hmm. That's the bottom for me, at least. So what my question is like, someone listening to this right now is like, they're at, they're at their end with it and they feel like they've tried everything else. It's like, what, what can we offer? The truth is I would feel like a fraud And I would not feel like I was in integrity if I could offer something that I feel would connect to a place that you've been, that my nervous system hasn't been. I can offer the things that I think. Mm -hmm. I can offer the things that I think um, other smart people that I've read would offer. But the heaviness of the situation is incredible Mm -hmm. because people have been lied to. And it's put them in a worse position than they would have been. But I don't know how to instill this, but I'll share what I know has been my foundational rock that has not ever broken. And it is the belief that anything that happens is literally my psyche, that thing that we were talking about earlier, has brought to me because I've asked to be great, that it has literally brought this to me in love and saying, you have to eat eat this now. You have to eat this experience. And I've had one 
and I'm, and I'm sure I'm going to get this question for the next 10 years. Like, have you ever been depressed and have you ever been on SSRIs? I've never been on SSRIs. My one true bout of depression, because I don't feel like I could ever claim that I was depressed. And honestly, I think that, uh, if I had the same internal judgment system, I would claim that I would have been depressed, but I think mine's more strict. But there was a moment where for a month, I did all the biological stuff that I knew was right. I did all the journaling. I did all the meditating. And for a month, I didn't care about anybody. I didn't care about my work. That's never been true in my adult life. And I didn't want to die, but I didn't care if I died. Mm -hmm. And the thing that like what brought me out of that was I don't remember how I got to this thought point, but I got to the thought point where I realized the entire strategy for my being that I was doing in the world, how I thought I should be, how I thought I should behave, who I thought the judges were to impress, what marks I thought I had to hit. I realized, oh my God, I'm lying to myself. That's not what I want to be. And literally in the span of minutes, I reconnected to what type of man I knew I wanted to be. And it was like this, oh my God moment where I realized for a month, I was lying to myself. I wasn't being the type of man I wanted to be. So I didn't feel good doing the things I was doing. And then the, the goal that I thought being that type of man would get me wasn't working either. Mm. So there was this sense of hopelessness, but there was this also this sense of like self-disgust because mm-hmm. I could feel like I wasn't being mm. true to myself. And so it was a story change. That's my truth. That's my mm. experience. And like, I'm sweating right now, feeling that being interpreted as my advice to people in the same place that you described that you were in. Mm. Change your story. No, it's not... That is not what I'm offering as advice. I'm giving that as an example of why I feel currently inept to give advice. Like I've been asking my friends, should I go to med school? Mm -hmm. Like, should I go become a fucking doctor so I can offer real solutions? Like that's how committed I am to this. Right. But I don't know. And what I'm hearing in all this, just kind of summarizing it and synthesizing it in my mind is, I think that you and I agree in the power of the mind. It is one of the most, it is the most finicky, sensitive, and powerful and immediate tools in existence. So. Ooh, you're inspiring me. Okay. So for me, and I'll just speak from my experiences with depression. It has been, to use your word, a game of reprogramming, reprogramming my mind. Now, when you're in a state that you are so low that you don't want anything, this is where it gets hard, right? When you have nothing to look forward to, you don't care about creating anything. You're not excited to see anyone you really don't want anything. That's the scary part because the mind needs a new program to run. It needs a new story. And so the biggest hurdle is that first hurdle of just deciding that even if it doesn't fucking work, even if you don't really want that thing so much to pick something, literally anything that makes you feel a sense of expansion when you think about it, instead of contraction. Even if that's like, I'm going to think about getting home in an hour to pet my dog. And that's like just a slightly better feeling thought that I can, no one's saying you have to go conquer the world or set some big goal, but maybe it's like, you know what, when I get really low, I'll create an anchor. This is, this has been mostly mitigated by my morning routine anyway, but when I get depressed, sometimes I'll slide out of my morning routine. And I'll be like, I don't even care about that. Like, why does it matter? And I'm like, no, no, no. Do the things that you know that work. I know it feels like a mountain that you can't climb, but just 
anchor to one thing. So I'll choose something, something easy. It doesn't matter what it is, but I will choose something and I will fucking do it if it's the last thing on earth that I do. So if I say I'm going to meditate, maybe that's my one thing. It doesn't matter whether I do it for three minutes or three hours. Probably don't set the bar for three hours because then you won't (laughs) do it and then you'll feel like shit. So it's not about how long or how well even that you work out or that you eat well or that you this. You just, you you make a commitment to yourself to do one thing that you know is going to make you feel more expansive than before and you focus on it. You focus your mind every second that you can. And it's like trying to exercise a weak muscle. It's hard. You can't lift that thought up for very long. It's exhausting. It's, it takes everything you've got. But over time, just starting with that one thing and then, hey, wait a minute. Like now I've been doing five pushups every day before bed. That's it. Five pushups. And now after a week, I'm already like, hey, my arms look pretty good. That's one thing. And I was like, well, that was really easy. Like maybe I want to like also add five squats. And then it's like the smallest thing. And then it snowballs into now I'm feeling a little better about my, my body. And I'm actually like sweating once a day in the small way. And it's, I probably don't even realize that I'm detoxing and now I'm getting more attention from the opposite sex. And like, this is how these things work. But when you're at the bottom, it feels like a hill that you don't have the energy to climb. So it, for me, it's about focusing on one tiny thing that I can anchor to and how am I going to feel successful today? What I love in that is it's the magic of the practical, like you don't have to go slay dragons. You can literally go brush your teeth and it starts to heal something biological and psychological. Mm -hmm. And I think that the part that my psyche lurches at wanting to offer is the dramatic story that you can tell for the practical to get started. And I truly believe. That's the rooster. He knows I'm about to draw some fire. (laughs) Um, I truly believe that within you, there is something that only you can produce in the world. And that the creation of that thing will be able to heal a certain person that nobody else could. Mm. And we need kings and queens. Like we need humans who step into the fullness of who they are now more than maybe ever literally. And what I would offer to people who might feel like they're in that stuck place is the first thing, run the experiment for a month that God is inside of you that God's sole goal is to help you become who you know you could be and that God is your ally. And God is just a word. I don't, it's not a gray beard man, whatever. Right. The universe, the, the universe. power of love, the goddess, whatever. It is in you mm. right now, literally hearing these words. And it, the only thing it wants to do is to help you become who you could be. So pray at the beginning of every day before you go to bed. 10 seconds. Please give me a sign. Please help me see what the next step is. Run that experiment for a month. Just try. Like if if you have nothing to lose, just Mm -hmm. try it. The other thing is buy the book Feeling Good by David Burns. This is the dude who made famous a type of psychological intervention called cognitive behavioral therapy. And he found It's the most studied type of psychological intervention that is not medical. It's more effective than all the other ones that have have been studied. And it's more effective than antidepressants in many studies. That book has been studied in place of a human interacting with you. And it's more effective than antidepressants and people doing standard care this book called Feeling Good by David Burns. The crux of what the book teaches you is your moods 
So there's a difference between emotions and moods. Emotions are the thing that happens right away. It comes up in you, right. but it falls away. Moods are when emotion is sustained. Right. And a mood can only be sustained by recurring thoughts. And then a mood becomes like a chronic state right. after that. It's almost like it's it's a balloon that in order to stay up in the air, the kid has to keep poking it. Mm-hmm. There is a part of you that if you haven't started to do the internal investigation, you don't even realize that we think something like 60,000 thoughts a day. I was just going to say this. Boom. This is why I named the podcast The Thought Room, by the way. 68,000 thoughts a day and 98% of them or something like that is are repeated every day. And if you're depressed, you can guarantee that they're negative. Right. What CBT teaches you is the top 10 most common ways that people who are depressed lie to themselves. And once you learn that list, you have a fucking superpower. Mm. Because as soon as you have that list- Can you name a few? Like off the top- The two most common ones that you see with people in relationships is mind reading Mm -hmm. and fortune telling. They don't like me. Right. Do you have any evidence for that? Making assumptions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Black and white thinking, overgeneralization, um, minimizing the positive, catastrophizing. Like Mm -hmm. these are all things that to get deeper and CBT doesn't go here, but. It's like the Byron Katie stuff too. She's like, is it true? Exactly. Yeah. Like. That is it true question. If you really use it on your mind, so much of your bullshit just evaporates because it's like, how do you know this? Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, there's a whole field of philosophy that's argued for 2000 years how you can know anything. So Mm -hmm. if you really connect to the fact that you actually can't know anything for sure, it's like you dig and dig and dig and then you realize you're flying. That there's the thing that I came to when I was like 22 is my philosophical investigation of myself got so intense. Like I almost lost my mind, Mm -hmm. but I finally had that breakthrough moment where I realized no one can know, capital K, know anything. We make up stories. Mm -hmm. What is the dopest story that I can make up? Exactly. And that's what I'm going to do. Mm. I love you, Eric Godzi. I love you, Hallie Rose. Thank you. I'm reaching you from across the table. I'm just so, so happy to talk to you and you're doing such cool shit. I'm just so proud to have you as my friend. And thank you for calling me out on mansplaining the first day that I met you. Always. Hey, I wanted to congratulate you too on your hater. I saw on your Instagram today that you got maybe one of your first haters. That means you really made it. How how are you dealing with that? That I used it as a funny way to let all my friends know why I'm not responding to them. Uh That was it. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you for seeing me when I think you could see that I wasn't seeing me and uh, for being one of those people in my life who have continued to do that. Because now it feels like I'm really starting to see myself, but there was a long point where I wasn't seeing myself and it took people like you to see that. So thank you. It's so easy. It's such a pleasure. I'll never forget that that first coffee we had at uh, radio. And I looked at you and I was like, I think you're a lot bigger than you believe you are. I remember. Yeah. And here we are. And my reflection to you is, you know how big you are. I don't know about that, man. I have my days. Yeah. (laughs) What's interesting is I feel like you probably only have your days when you're alone, but when you have to show up for somebody you love. Mm. Yeah, you're right. Thank you again for being on today. Thank you. And the caveat that I want to offer people is I am not saying that you're wrong for taking antidepressants. That's a judgment that I don't have. What I'm inspired by is giving people the information that wasn't given to them Mm -hmm. so you can make informed, consensual choices. Mm -hmm. And I will be spending the rest of my life 
coming up with solutions. And if people have questions for you, I know you're busy because you're writing the book and stuff right now, but I guess we just want to tell people again where they can find you, your website and your Instagram. Uh, my website is Eric Gotsy. My Instagram is the same thing, G-O-D-S-E-Y. Um, Eric with a K on the end. Eric with a K. Uh, and I have an email list that I send emails out to. I have to write that today, by the way. It's going out tomorrow, gang, gang. Um, that you, you can find on the website. Good. You can wish me happy birthday in that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>